in the book of Galatians, I got, I despaired, frankly, every commentary interpreted Galatians in the light of Ephesians. The fact that it was written years earlier under a different economy didn't seem to even strike any of the, any of the writers. Same with Romans. Romans were written before Ephesians. It's dealing with a different economy. So people try and read Ephesians truth back into Romans. They even try and read Ephesians truth back into the Gospels. I did a course, uh, taught a course, tried to teach a course for the Anglican Church. A Gospel course based on the book of Mark. You ever tried to teach salvation by grace through faith from Mark? <laughs> Try and do it for your homework. When, you, when am I coming back? Another 20 years? <laughs> See if you can do it in 20 years. It's very, very... In the end, I basically give up. And I'm into the epistles. Because it's very difficult to do that. So they were there. Salvation has come to make Israel envious. Now, Israel is pictured as an olive tree. And the picture given you is that some of the natural branches are broken off. <clears throat> Many of them would understand this, would understand this very easily. Lots and lots of olive groves over there, big olive groves. Olives were very, very important to them, not only as a source of food, of cooking oil, but also of light. That's what they tended to burn in the evening in their lamps, was olive oil. So olives were very, very important, and there were lots and lots of them. Yes, the first crushing of the olive tree was probably the, the olive oil that you, that, you, that you drank or had on your salads. The next one was maybe the ones that you, the next pressing was maybe the ones you cooked with. The last pressing was probably the ones you, you put in your oil lap as, the, as it deteriorated in the quality. But some of those branches of an olive tree were not bearing fruit. <coughs> in real... Um, olive culture, what tends to happen is the olives on the tree start to get smaller and smaller. So you have the stones stay the size, same size, but the fruit gets smaller and smaller. The old olive tree is getting old. It's beginning to flag. And they can last for hundreds of years. They tell me some can last for a thousand years. I went to Israel and they told me the olive trees in the uh, opposite the Jerusalem were the very olive trees that were in the Garden of Gethsemane when Christ was there. Whether they're true or not, I really don't know. The things they tell tourists can't always believe. But uh, they do, they are very, very old. And you plant an olive tree, not for yourself, not for your children, but for your grandchildren. It can take an olive tree 70, 80 years to bear fruit. It takes a long time to become established. And so the olive farmers had actually discovered a method by which they could actually stimulate an aging olive tree back into life to give good fruit for many more years. And around the olive groves, you would find wild olives growing. And what they would do, if an olive tree started to give this thin fruit, this poor quality fruit, is they would cut off a branch of the olive tree and they would bind in a branch from the wild olive. Cut off a branch from the wild olive, cut off a branch from the cultivated olive and bind in Bind it in tightly with ropes so that it would take root and the vigour, hopefully, from the wild olive tree would stimulate that ageing, cultivated olive to bear fruit. And so the wild branches were grafted in. The wild branches are the examples of the Gentiles. Would the Gentiles coming in to the kingdom, if you like, the Gentiles being saved, the Gentiles rejoicing in Jesus Christ, would that stimulate, would that stimulate this olive tree of Israel into responding? So that's why they were bounded, and that's what was going on in the book of the Acts. The Gentiles there were being saved, if you like. It says to make Israel envious, and I think that is probably the correct translation, but it's almost, and one of the other meanings of the world is to make Israel emulate the Gentiles. And one or two translations do that. And you know, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel, Israel emulate them. And that's really what God wanted to do. As the Gentiles were putting their faith into Jesus Christ, he wanted the Jews to do the same, to emulate those Gentiles. And so, back in Antioch, 
in Pisidia. Let's go back to Acts 13 then. The initial opposition was when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. And then there was further opposition in verse 50. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of the high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So here you have God-fearing women. These were women that attended the synagogue. Their families and they themselves had not yet made this, the step of becoming proselytes, but they were God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They had influence. And so the Jews went to these women and said, use your influence. This man is wrong. Let's go to the leading men of the city. Let's get this guy out. Let's get these guys, Paul and Barnabas, out. Now remember what happened when he was in Arabia? It seems to be exactly the same thing happened there. Aretas, the governor for, under Aretas, was after Paul. Why? Have the Jews done something similar there? They'd gone to the leading people and said, we've got to get this person out. He's causing trouble in our community. And so they expelled Paul and Barnabas from that region. What was the persecution? Well, we don't really know. But where did they go next? They went to Iconium. Sylvia, if you'd like to read for us Acts chapter 14, verses 1 to 7, if you'd all like to turn to it. This is what happened then at Iconium, please. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lithonian cities of Lystra and Derby and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. So we find that Paul goes from Antioch to Iconium. He's had a rough time from the Jews in the synagogue at Antioch, but his first place he goes to in Iconium is a synagogue. The next thing we notice is there's opposition. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Now remember that this implies a certain Jews who did believe. Certain Jews did believe. But the Jews who refused to believe, they stirred up the Gentiles. Now remember he's talking about Gentiles in the synagogue here. Yeah? Alright? Doesn't state whether they're God fearers. They probably are, because the pagans normally wouldn't go in there, wouldn't be in there at all. Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, in spite of the opposition, and the city was divided. See, the Jews had this ability to take it outside of the synagogue into the community. This shows how influential they were in their communities. In many of the communities, they were very influential. So the city was decided, and the impending persecution this time was to <coughs> ill-treat them and to stone them. But they got the city to agree to this. So Paul and Barnabas fled. And it tells us they went in to go on to the cities of Lystra and Derby, and they went into the surrounding countryside. Interested, they went to the surrounding countryside. Why did they go to the countryside? Well, probably they went to the countryside off the beaten roads, because they were in fear of their life. So maybe they went into the countryside because it was harder to find them, and they probably took a roundabout route to those cities. So where to now? Lystra, Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 20. Please, right there. Thank you. Would you like to turn to that, please? Acts chapter 14, verses <coughs> 8 to 20. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, 
Stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped off and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lysonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from the heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they have difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking that he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. I don't know whether there was a synagogue in this street. It doesn't tell us at this point in time. It tells us something interesting, though, that there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. When where Paul was speaking, sometimes he'd speak in marketplaces. They had places like that. Poets could speak there, philosophers could speak there, it's all part of the Greek culture. But then we have a statement which has caused lots of problems. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. I think that's a wrong translation. I said earlier on, that the Greek word suzo can be translated healed or it can be translated saved. And I think what happened here was Paul saw this man had faith to be saved and he had compassion on him. Here was a crippled man sitting there listening to what Paul had to say about the Lord Jesus Christ and believing what he said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man had faith to be saved. That's what I think it is. That is the teaching of Scripture. Your faith saves you. There's one or two places where the King James Version and the New International Version and others come up with this statement, your faith has healed you. And it's wrong. There were ten lepers, if you remember. One of them went back to Christ and worshipped him. And our translations have that Christ turns to this man and says, your faith has healed you. Well, what about the other nine? They were all healed. They didn't have faith. I think what our Lord is saying to that leper that came back and worshipped him is your faith has saved you. He had physical healing and he also had spiritual healing. And this, this, this translation has caused an awful lot of hardship to many Christians. Many Christians who think the reason they haven't been healed by the Lord is because they don't have enough faith. That is not the teaching of the New Testament. That is a distortion, I believe, of what the New Testament is talking about. So, he then heals a pagan Gentile before pagans. And this is the first record we have of a pagan being healed in front of pagans. And what's the result? Well, when healings were done in front of the Jews, they debated it. Was it on the Sabbath? Was it right on the Sabbath? What does this mean? What's going on here? What does this signify? What happens with the pagans? They start to worship Paul and Barnabas. No Jew would ever do that. Look at the miracles that Christ performed and how reluctant the Jews were to actually honour him as their Messiah and the Son of God. <clears throat> Basically, the Jewish history had stacks of miracles in it. Look at the miracles that Moses did. Look at the miracles Elijah did. They were used to people doing miracles. And what they asked was basically, what does this mean? What does this symbolize? What's God trying to say? Is God working through you? But the Gentiles, the pagan Gentiles saw it and ah, they, were, they were blown, blown by it. However, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. 
They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. Remember the words of the Lord? I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. Paul is beginning to suffer. Not suffer rejection, not suffer arguments. That's about the most we go through, isn't it? It's the most I've ever suffered. But you're now physical abuse. Stoning. Can you imagine what a Jewish stoning is like? You know, it's mean, a pretty horrible thing to, be, to stand there and have people all around you or have you backed into a corner and start throwing stones at you. Not small stones. Can you imagine standing there and having 50 people throw cricket balls at you? Huh? I mean, that's no fun, is it? Many of them would be the size of cricket balls, many of them would be bigger. And as you fell and as you staggered, so they would come in with bigger and bigger ones. And they thought Paul was dead. It must have been some stone. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up. And what did he do? Did he flee into the countryside? He went back into the city. I find that amazing. I find that absolutely staggering. The last place in the world I would have gone was back into the city, I'll be honest with you. I'm a coward, I keep my trainers on. There's no way I would have gone back into the city. This man went back into the city. Why did he go back into the city? Because there were some people there who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he go back in to see this cripple? Or this ex-cripple, man? Wouldn't surprise me if he didn't. But anyway, the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So they went to Derby. <clears throat> and then, what did they do from Derby? Well, he could have actually gone from Derby to Tarsus. It wouldn't have been too difficult a journey. From Derby to Tarsus, just across to there. But he doesn't. So if you'd like to read Acts 14, 21 to 28 for us, please. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia and when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the, gen to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So, I think if it had me, and I was in Derby, I'd have gone home to Tarsus. But where does he go? He goes back to Lystra, where he'd been stoned. He goes back to Iconium, where they'd hounded him out of the city. He goes back to Antioch, where there was a great position. Could anything deter this guy? I find Paul one of the most amazing people in the history of the world. When you stop to think what he went through and what he did, would any of you honestly have done that? I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have gone back to Lystra. I wouldn't have gone to Iconium. I wouldn't have gone to Antioch. I'd have kept miles away from them. But he went back. There were Christians there now. And he wanted to show them that their faith in Christ was important. His faith in Christ was important to him. Jesus had died for his sins. He had eternal life. And whatever he was going to put up with in this life mattered not. And later he, what did he write? Worse the effect is the light and momentary troubles of this world are nothing compared with the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. He didn't say that the troubles of this world are light and momentary. They are not. I'm certain some of you have had problems which are far from light, and I'm certain some of you have had problems which have lasted many years. They're not light and they're not momentary. But 
the light and momentary, when compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. And that's his point. That is his point. And so he goes back. He goes back, encouraging them, strengthening them, telling them, putting it laid on, look, you're going to suffer. You are going to suffer. Look what I've suffered. But it does not deter me. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. He is your saviour. So, stick it. Stick it. He goes back to Syria. And they stayed there a long time. They stayed there a long time. So, a time of rest and relaxation? He deserved it, didn't he? Hmm? He deserved it. He deserved to put his feet up by the Mediterranean Sea. Have a pin's number one served to him? 